Welcome to Energy Talks, the uh, podcast for energy nerds and folks who like interesting conversation. Today's guest is Lorian Nesbitt, an assistant professor of urban prof uh, forestry and environmental justice at the University of British Columbia. So welcome to the interview, Lorian. Hi, thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, this is timely because, of course, we've got heat waves all over the place. And um, you and I are both in British Columbia, which is not having a heat wave at the, at the moment. It's kind of unseasonally cold and wet. Nevertheless, in other parts of the world, and you're an expert on urban forestry, which uh, is an important part of cities um, creating a cooler environment. Uh, so maybe let's just talk about uh, rising temperatures and heat. We had a heat dome a few years ago, a bunch of people killed, uh, 600, I think, in, in BC. How yeah. is it becoming a more prevalent problem? Yeah, my understanding is that it is becoming more prevalent or at least more common. Um, and even though we live in a, a region that's typically cool, we're not adapted to or used to higher temperatures. And so when we get those strong changes in temperatures, they can lead to real um, negative health outcomes and, and also just other stresses on how we live our lives. Uh, you know, I remember uh, not that long ago when, when climate scientists were saying, you know, it's not like this is going to be you're going to be turning up the heat gradually over time. It's going to become more volatile and, you, you know, you'll see these heat waves or you'll have other kinds of weather anomalies. And that seems to be kind of the, the pattern, isn't it? I mean, we weren't expecting things to get this hot this quick. Yeah, and when it does become hot, the hot weather can stay in one place for longer. And so we get day after day of heat which leads to build up in terms of the heat that our infrastructure is absorbing and our, our cities get hotter and hotter, but also the heat stress that our bodies feel compounds because we're not uh, cooling off at night. Interesting. Um, what are three things that cities can do, and I guess communities in general can do, to relieve some of this stress on, on people uh, and on their infrastructure? Yeah, so I think cities are already starting to do these things, but not necessarily at the scale or in the way that it needs to be done. So one is that certainly in this part of the world, we need to be thinking about cooling our buildings. And so that means designing buildings so that we have passive cooling because our energy grid can't necessarily sustain everyone using air conditioning at the same time, as well as mechanical cooling in some cases. And so cities are doing things like providing uh, cooling kits or helping people learn how to make low cost fans for their houses or for their rooms. Um, and then there is more work on the architectural side around how do we make buildings that cool themselves or, or that uh, receive better passive cooling. And that's sort of outside of my area of expertise, but a lot of my colleagues are working on that. Um, another thing we can be doing is um, greening our cities. And this does two things. So overall, if we're putting a lot of vegetation into our cities, especially trees that are shading um, our streets and our buildings, we can reduce the overall urban heat island effect. So this is where cities are hotter because we have more energy and more people in one spot. And so especially with the gray infrastructure, it absorbs heat and cities are a couple of degrees hotter than elsewhere. And so if we can green our cities and our regions generally, it can reduce the overall temperature in that city. That also can include removing gray infrastructure like pavement that absorbs uh, heat as much as we can and providing um, like soft surface, like like grass and soil. Um, but then as we are planting trees and putting other green infrastructure into place, we need to be prioritizing where people are moving. So during the heat dome, I remember I was off work with my then two year old, I guess, and we were trying to figure out, okay, where could we go? We had no fans and no air conditioning in our house. We lived in the front half of a house. And so our airflow was not ideal. And so I was trying to figure out how do I keep them cool other than just like, you know, sitting in the shower all day. Um, and so we would try to walk to a spray park or to a pool or to a park. There was only one street in my neighborhood that had adequate shade so that we could actually walk to anywhere without getting overheated ourselves. And so prioritizing um, planting large trees or maintaining mature trees along roadways is really important especially related to transportation. So we're doing some research with seniors right now, and they really highlight that they need shading when they're waiting for the bus um, or when they're going about their daily life um, as a particularly vulnerable population to heat. What about urban forestry? I mean, this is kind of your area of expertise. And I, I've seen in the, you know, the 
press releases and so on that I get in my inbox, that there seems to be more of an emphasis on this, uh, that cities are trying to green themselves. And they're, they're trying to green things like the tops of buildings, office buildings, you know, plant, uh, uh, install plants up there. Mm -hmm. uh, is this movement, how big is it now? And is it accelerating? Certainly cities, and I think the public in general is more aware of the importance of urban forests or urban trees and green infrastructure. And we saw that really um, grow around the pandemic as people were spending more, more time outside. Um, and so cities are um, developing urban forestry staff capacity, for example. They're developing urban forest management plans. Um, I think we still need to get to a place where we are planting more trees and maintaining the trees that we have um, to a higher standard, and that means really funding this work more. Trees are relatively low cost, but we need to fund them so that we're keeping them healthy. You know, they're these beings who are supposed to be helping us adapt to climate change. They also need space, they need water, they need us to care for them, especially in the first uh, few years of their life so that they can thrive in cities. Because it's not an easy place to live in a city as a tree. It sounds like this is more of a local government issue, or at least the, the staff and the plans will come at the local government. And local governments, uh, in my experience, are generally stretched pretty thin. Is that a problem? Yeah, so in Canada, it is a local government issue. It doesn't need to be. In the United States, they've had the United States Forest Service as part of the USDA for many years. They've been leading on um, research as well as community engagement and work on the ground. We don't have real involvement from the federal government in urban greening or urban forestry in Canada, and we could have as well as at the provincial level, because yeah, municipalities are cash strapped. They can be responsible for implementing urban forestry, but in terms of real funding or coordinated plans or sharing knowledge and expertise across the country, I think um, the federal and provincial governments can do more. And th that also relates to the fact that I think adaptation through nature really needs to be grounded in what communities are already doing. So. For example, during the heat dome, the people who were best able to survive and be healthy were those that had good social networks, that had people checking up on them, that knew where to go to be cool in their neighborhood. And so communities are already doing this work. As we're implementing green infrastructure or other climate adaptation, we need to understand that. It also requires some investment to engage communities so that our adaptation planning and implementation will actually meet them where they're at instead of um, just like doing what we think is a good idea. But um, could actually cause harm or just invest dollars that aren't um, productively um, implemented. Now, here at Energy Media, our, our beat is kind of, you know, energy and, and some climate. And we've made the point many times that, you know, the global economy is in the midst of a technological revolution. We have all this wonderful new technology that's coming onto the market. Are there any technologies either that are here now or coming in the near future that can help to alleviate this problem? I think there's um, lots of potential for technological innovation, as long as it connects with what people's experiences of heat are. So this is part of why we're trying to understand these local experiences of heat. Um, a lot of the people who are most um, vulnerable to heat are seniors. So they would have to be technologies that seniors are comfortable using. Some um, people are putting just sort of small temperature sensors in homes so that people know when it's getting too hot. Um, sometimes, especially seniors, won't feel as hot as they are, and so they're not aware of the heat stress that their body is experiencing. Um, I think there's also lots of potential for the use of digital tools and AI to like answer questions around how do you stay cool or to connect people with each other. Um, but I think a lot of the the work that has to be done is just understanding the experience of heat first, and then we can um, accurately apply technologies to help us meet the needs that communities have. Now, hang on. Are, are you suggesting that that we still don't have a very good understanding of how heat works in a city? Well, we understand how heat works to some degree. So we understand, uh, we don't understand totally how um, and this is a bit outside my field because I'm not a climatologist but we don't totally understand the ways in which heating or like radiant um, heat or energy from the sun heats um, local environments or uh, influences air temperatures and then how green infrastructure or shading moderates that um, especially because we don't understand the ways in which that interacts with built form or um, evapotranspiration from trees 
And then we're also trying to understand how those more um, sort of quantitative measures or um, like objective measures of um, heat link to people's perceptions of heat or their thermal comfort. So that's an active area of research among some of my colleagues here at UBC, um, especially to try and understand how these dynamics work in different climates. So a climate like Vancouver's is different from a climate in the southern states, for example. And so what does it mean to green um, and provide shade in this, in this environment? I think more importantly, though, we don't understand what people are doing when it's hot. So cooling centers are something that our governments offer often, and people don't use them. They're woefully underused. Um, and we're trying to figure out why that is. Usually, from what, or what we're hearing from our research participants is that it's because it has nothing to do with their daily life. They have things to do, they have places to go, they have social networks. They're not related to the cooling center. And so if we're going to be providing things like water, cool spaces, washrooms, how do those align with what people are already doing? Because most of us can't just kind of go to a cooling center all day. We have lives, we have caring responsibilities, we have jobs, you know, whatever. Those are important. Uh, maybe we can wrap up the interview this way, uh, Lorian. If uh, you could just give a few tips to folks who are looking to change their yard, their garden, their maybe their community, uh, maybe they belong to a community association that's looking at doing some greening. Um, have you got any tips for them? Yeah, um, don't put AstroTurf or um, like the fake stuff down, please. If you're gonna green your yard, do grass or clover even, because then, you know, we can feed the pollinators as well. If you're gonna plant a tree, that's great. Um, think about how that tree is gonna fit into that space. So if you have a small space, a small tree when it's mature, if you have a larger space, plant that larger shade tree and that'll really provide benefits for your neighbors as well. You need to water your tree really well for the first two to five years of its life. And that means giving it like half an hour to an hour of water. You can use wastewater from your house to do that as well if you don't want to run the hose. Um, and then also in terms of creating resilience in your neighborhood, I would say people need to know their neighbors. They need to know who to check on when it's hot. They need to identify who maybe doesn't have family to check on them or people who are living in smaller places. And so this might mean having like a building party or a block party or um, doing volunteer activities so you can meet your neighbors and finding a way for people to sign up to like a WhatsApp group so they can check on each other. It's really important that we know we have neighbors um, to help us survive these types of extreme weather events because the city can't do it all for us. Maureen, thank you very much. Really appreciate this. Thanks so much. This is really fun.